considering we worth enough uh, for this little interaction and also for this opportunity uh, thank you for hosting vichara dr uh, vidyut sir and uh, bijo sir uh, those are the two people whom i know in person i know there are more people involved but uh, they were the ones who had made this little interaction or a discussion whatever we call it uh, possible um to speak about jawaharlal nehru that to to an audience uh, like this would be more like the ninth husband of uh, elizabeth taylor the uh, english american actress the, uh, the late uh, popular english american actress i hope you're aware that uh, she had married almost eight or nine times in her life and uh, just as elizabeth knew what would happen in marriage most of us know almost everything about pandit nehru and uh, therefore the challenge for every new husband of elizabeth was to do things differently so as to keep her interested in the relationship and i think uh, the task before me today is also something quite similar i'll 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 have to attempt doing things differently to keep you involved uh, and interested in this little conversation which i think the time allotted is about uh, 40 to 45 minutes i'll try to kind of uh, uh, find time for a little interaction as well and uh, yeah that's it so that's the agenda uh, which uh, i have in mind so as i said speaking about nehru becomes extremely challenging primarily because nehru has been of course arguably the most celebrated the most uh, qualified and almost uh, the, the most vilified personality of of the past uh, couple of years another difficulty is that there are far too many nehrus to talk about there's this uh, young restless lawyer and a congressman then there is this nehru the socialist nehru the exalted uh, foreign policy expert a world leader of of known for the non aligned movement you know initiating conversations on those lines nehru the thinker the writer the philosopher the probably there is also another uh, uh, nehru which is not much spoken about the nehru the disheartened or the, the the disillusioned man particularly after 1962 because most of his if you look at his biography most of his wrong decisions were are all after 1962 or the in, the intentions were different but then uh, it didn't uh, you know give the results which he had in mind was mostly after 1962 and what makes it further challenging especially in the times that we are living in is that if there is something that ails our polity and society it gets traced back to nehru for some reason or the other uh, most of the times without any reason to so uh, in 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 today's interaction or in, in this vichara i would prefer to share my sort of cocktail of multiple nehrus which i have experienced uh through the available literatures few of which i have read i'm not claiming everything but a few of which i have come across and i found interesting uh one might wonder uh, you know what would a commerce professor speak about uh, jawaharlal nehru uh, and that's why at the outset i said uh, or rather i confessed that i'm no expert in the subject i i just have an interest in the subject i'm i'm, I'm therefore open for correction Uh, thank you once again uh, for the trust and the confidence you've reposed uh, both with you sir and uh, uh, biju sir and whoever has made this event possible if uh, republic of india was a startup nobody would have funded it in august 1947 primarily because no one thought this decision to bring in a committee of nations would survive but no one then believed that india as an independent country would last long so india was written off at birth itself and there are kind of quite a lot of historical references to 
uh, especially the the British officers, what they had written, not in favor of um, you know giving independence, because the Republic of India is the most reckless political experiment in human history, and 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 as uh, the the seasoned and and reasoned uh, historian Ramchandra Guha had said, it is the most ambitiously reckless and recklessly ambitious attempt to construct a nation state that too an attempt amidst the then prevailing uh, circumstances or the conditions or the social systems or the realities which were extremely inhospitable which were extremely infertile as well so basically our country was divided partly by the britishers divide and rule strategies and partly by our own in intrinsic uh, you know uh, the the, the socio-political divisions of culture, caste, creed, region, religion, language, most of which still continues and, and what not. Yeah. So if you go back, I mean, that's probably a, a commerce professor's perspective. I spoke about the uh, looking at it as a startup and then I, I think I, it's better that I also state a few statistics here. Um, if you look at the poverty rate, it was roughly around 70%. Literacy rate was 12%. Female literacy was further worse, which was close to 9%, 8.9 or 9%, which means 90% of the population in 90, 1947 were living below the poverty line with absolutely no access to primary education. Now, the average life expectancy was also further worse. It was like around 27 years. The infant mort mortality was about 218 per thousand, which means uh, around 22 children out of every 100 newborn babies would I mean, survive. Now, that was the sad state of affairs post-independence. British, of course, had left us after 200 years of colonization and exploitation, and uh, never before in the history was a country so divided, so large, so complex, constituted as a single nation as well. Never ever in human history has such a miracle happened. So adding more, uh, there was mass famine, destitution, epidemics. Uh, there were communal disturbances for obvious reasons. So they were both natural and man-made challenges, all of which had stopped uh, our country aside. Above all, I think that's more important. The Freedom struggle was in the hope of an independent, free, and a united India. But unfortunately, we got a free, not a united India. I'm referring to the partition with the flames of uh, violence across the country, a lot of millions of people being killed. If I'm not wrong, about 13 million uh, were destitute or displaced, lost a loss of property was another uh, bigger concern. Refugees pouring in from uh, you know, across the frontiers. So the whole nation was chaotic, um, unsettled, and, and, and unrest. And that's the premise on which I began our conversation, stating that had India been a startup in August 1947, no one would have invested in it. How did this nation once written off at birth survive? And, and, and not just survive, you know, if you go by the IMF report of 2019, to be more precise, in October 2019, it said that India would evolve as an economic superpower by 2024. I'm not very sure whether that uh, statistic still stands relevant because post pandemic things have been different. But they had made such predictions in 2019. So given what we were in 1947 and where we are today, I think we've come a long way. And I believe this feat that we have achieved today is mostly because of the sheer quality of the leaders that we had and the institutions they built and nurtured literally from nothing. And what many thought of India's weakness I mean, that's also one reason why, why many had written off India. The weakness had in turn 
bec uh, become our strength. I'm talking about the diversities, you know, how, uh, the, the, how divided we were, but how united we are. That's why we proudly say that the only thing that is singular about India of today, as much as it has ever been, is its plurality. And we take pride in being the citizens of this country with, and, and celebrate our diversities in terms of customs or caste, cuisine, uh, creed, consonant, or any, any, anything for that matter. So India had matured to be celebrated as a melting pot of, 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 a, of a cliched adage, unity in, 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 in diversity. So, the point here is, you know, uh, there's something which an Italian uh, statesman, uh, Massimo, had said, we have made Italy, now we have to make Italians. But that wasn't true with India. India had its own traditions and values, and, and the core ethos of which was multicultural traditions and uh, the peaceful coexistence of, of, of people, despite the differences. And, and, and of course, thanks also to the founding fathers, for the robust, the, the, the solid foundations they laid for ensuring and solidifying uh, whatever we had. Uh, now, nevertheless, the, the, the country post-independence literally had to start from the scratch. And Pandit Nehru, being the first Prime Minister of India, had been in the forefront, as we call him, the chief architect or the editor of, of, of the modern India. and. Uh, being the prime minister for, of this country for almost 17 years, I don't think 17, uh, close to uh, 16 uh, years and eight to nine months, Pandit Nehru for his contribution is much looked up to uh, in you know the multiple roles, multiple caps that he had, uh, had borne, maybe as a statesman, as I mentioned, as a diplomat, as an administrator, as a scholar, historian, as a writer, as an orator, of course, the the rationalist or the atheist, the journalist, which he was, because he had also started a, a newspaper. So there are multiple things that he had done uh, in, in his lifespan. But uh, one of the questions which probably you might have in mind is why Nehru? You know, why did I choose Nehru or, 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 and, and why remembering him now? Why is he still important? Um, we do, of course, do uh, the, celebrate his birthday as, as Children's Day or the Bal Divas, uh, we of course do celebrate more as a ritual uh, his death uh, death anniversary. But uh, Nehru is not someone I believe uh, to be remembered only on these two days, and and that's probably the the context which I probably the narrative which I I wish to set in this little forum. I feel the moral urgency to celebrate Nehru so much now than any time before. Because we live in a time when Nehru and the leaders of his generation or, or, or leaders of his times are constantly and at times being even consciously being repudiated. When, when I say repudiated, being systematically attempted uh, or, or there is a systematic refusal to accept the contribution of this great person and most often being misquoted as well. You know, things are taken completely out of context and, and, and has attributed for all wrong reasons to Nehru. So I think uh, the way I've understood Nehru is what I'm trying to interpret. As I said, you could correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it has become quite, in fact, fashionable to denigrate and sometimes even not acknowledge the foresightedness or the vision um, of, of his contributions. It has gone to the extent of blatantly rejecting some of his ideas. And I, I, I remember an incident in 2017 uh, when uh, the president, the president in office, still in office, uh, when he made his first uh, address to Rajya Sabha, he omitted Pandit Nehru and while he was also mentioning so many other national leaders, um, the makers of modern India. Uh, he, I don't know whether it was intentional or unintentional, but there was also constant undermining of several other great leaders of, of, of our freedom, struggle, independence and thereafter. But the more we try to understand about Nehru, 
I think these omissions or this these kind of conscious attempts of sidelining just shows how mean and how narrow-minded. Uh, you know, that's I think a, a little more gentler way of of, of um, you know these people are. Um, and and probably that's one of the reasons. I, I felt it is important to re-examine the legacy of Nehru from the developments and perspectives of our times. Because one uh, would find um, attempts to character assassinate a, a figure like Nehru, referring to him as uh, one example is uh, he's often quoted as a womanizer. But the, uh, the, while the fact of, of, of the matter is that the picture which gets circulated in the denizens of the WhatsApp university is with his own, um, you know, sister and cousin sister. And I think it was a return from one of his foreign trips, and that picture was taken with his own sister and cousin sister, which gets kind of morphed and, you know, kind of uh, portrayed in, in in a different context. So it's therefore crucial that we bust these sort of, uh, as I said, uh, these uh, these propaganda or misinformation that goes around. In, in, in the denizens of WhatsApp University, or, or probably the fake news which floats around the internet, and make conscious attempts to understand the values that this person had fought for or stood, stood for. So uh, it's been uh, 57 years that uh, Nehru uh, passed, uh, I think, in, in 1960 64. Uh, probably unleashing the, the entire dossier of what uh, Jarlal Nehru and his contribution is, is would be a little difficult or challenging, uh, or probably I'll make a futile attempt in, in the, the time that we have. But I wish to give a little perspective on, on his early childhood, because those are the experiences or those tutelages what made him what he, he became later on as a giant figure. Uh, there are a few life instances uh, as, as well, which I think uh, had molded him as a visionary statesman. So that's something which I'll make an attempt to. So, but uh, Jarlal Nehru was born in Allahabad to Swarup Rani and uh, Motilal Nehru, uh, a statesman and a, a self-made, uh, extremely successful barrister, a, a lawyer, because he used to spend his... Uh, vacations in Paris and UK. And Motilal was a respected, quite a lucrative lawyer by profession who could, as I said, afford spending his vacations abroad. And he belonged to the Kashmiri Pandit community. Uh, Swarup Rani was uh, Motilal's uh, second wife, uh, the first uh, having died in childbirth. When Jawaharlal was three years old, his father had moved to Anand Bhavan. And, and, and this Anand Bhavan was a the rambling house with you know its own swimming pool it had electricity during those times you know running water and so many other things so many luxuries of of those times so we can say that nehru was born with silver spoon in his mouth and extremely pampered and spoiled adored and indulged as he was the only and the eldest son in his family and and, and he had mentioned that in his autobiography as well um, you know, um, because you know, uh, three brothers of Nehru couldn't survive. They either died premature or or, or by birth or later. And uh, as I said, Jawaharlal validates uh, the spoilage, if I can, uh, in 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 the very beginning of his autobiography. And uh, though unacceptable, the boys of such families, even now, um, to to a large extent, get more priorities and attention, which Nehru also did receive. The rest two were uh, uh, younger to Nehru, and uh, later on, they also became popular. One is Vijayalakshmi Pandit, uh, who was the United Nations uh, UN General Assembly president, and uh, Krishna, uh, I, I forget his her, her second name. Uh, he had, she had written a lot of books on Nehru, on her on her brother. I mean, that way she is also quite popular. Now, as I said, Nehru was fortunate and blessed with. All the prejudices of an aristocratic, affluent family that he was born in, but he describes his childhood as uh, as sheltered, lonely, ostracized, 
uneventful, etc. Because you know uh, he, his childhood was lonely more because uh, he was he didn't have uh, he was confined within the four walls of his bungla. He was educated by a series of English governesses, a few private tutors, uh, and except for one, I think it was Ferdinand uh, uh, Ferdinand T. Brooks who had a, a major influence on, on Nehru. Nobody else actually influenced the thoughts and ideas of, of Nehru. But Ferdinand uh, T. Brooks had made an impression on, on, on Nehru, uh, and which and the interest lasts for long. It, 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 it endured on two aspects. One, his taste for reading. And second, is his interest in science and, and its mysteries. So basically, theosophy and, 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 and science is what uh, uh, Ferdinand had, uh, uh, you know, generated or create, created in, in Nehru. So Nehru at 16 goes uh, in, uh, I think, 1905, uh, is sent to Harrow School, London. Uh, he liked the place, but uh, there was some sort of an intellectual restraint uh, which kind of bothered him. Later, he joins Trinity College, Cambridge, and he graduates in, in, in triple major chemistry uh, geology and some other subject. But his interests were something more broader. Most of these decisions were taken by his family. His interest was into literature, his in interest was into politics, his interest was into history. And that's what made him do other uh, you know, majors as well. But Jawaharlal, while, while uh, he joined Cambridge, he was very introvert and shy, very uh, uh, reserved in character, and that prevented him uh, speaking in, in the majlis. Majlis is a forum like this, like uh, uh, you know the discussion forum which where we are having this chat. And he was uh, uh, he was deterred uh, that deterred him from uh, taking part in any sort of discussions. And often uh, Nehru used to pay fine where uh, you know people who are not active in such forums were asked to uh, make a fine pay a fine and Jawaharlal often paid the fine so he was very introvert uh, his kind of childhood was ostracized and lonely his most of his academic decisions were made by his family uh, but then his interests were broader as i mentioned was literature was into history uh, politics and so, so on and so forth now, Jarlal learns uh, learned uh, law, or he earned law degree, and simultaneously he he took lessons from London School of Economics, and and this exposure is probably uh, which laid the foundations. Uh, I mean, that's what uh, some of the literatures which I have read uh, says uh, of his interest, or uh, laid the foundations in socialism in his political thought process thereafter. So in short, Nehru was fortunate to receive a wide, a very snobbish, expensive education, which was inaccessible for a larger chunk of society then and even now. But uh, I know Shashi Tharoor, in, in one of his interviews, had, uh, puts it differently. He says Nehru came out with a second class degree, but with a first class education. And, and, and that's primarily because of his interest and ability to read and reflect and cross connect or rather cross pollinate, uh, you know, the, the cross uh, or understand the cross connections of the different disciplines. But uh, you know, he had this ability to go beyond the academics. And I think these are lessons, you know, though Nehru graduated with second class, he was extremely good with understanding the interdisciplinarity of, of the sub subjects or the cross connectedness of the subjects. His travel, probably his education, his interactions with people from uh, you know, across the globe, his reading, writing, reflections, I think all of that had broadened his views, not just about the, the broadened his worldviews, but also his ideas about India. He, he used to read a lot about India and its history. Now, he also did appreciate and value the social and interpersonal skills in maintaining. I mean, he was extremely good with that. I mean, that's what uh, most of the literatures uh, says. He had he used to create a sort of an aura uh, whenever he uh, you know enters a, a forum or you know, and that 
uh, is primarily because he established a, a very close, intimate conversation, open conversation. He was willing to have discussions and debates with people. I mean, all these are developments later, not in the in early phase of his academic life. Now, he returns from London, from his wealth of uh, you know, experience, and uh, it is said that he used to remain as a constant drifter, never anchored on anything, and didn't know what to do with his life. Uh, he had no mission, no focus, either personally in, in his personal life or in his professional life. As Guha says, as, as Ramchandra Guha says, he was a, more of a Laparva uh, kind of a kid. And uh, he didn't like his father's job, though uh, Nehru was also a lawyer by profession. He did enroll at the Allahab, uh, Allahabad court, high court, but he didn't practice it because he was neither a good lawyer nor a, an interested lawyer. So um, here uh, Nehru also had made a, a failed attempt in clearing civil service. Uh, you know, and, 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 and he didn't succeed, as I said. So the real calling for him, uh, or rather, uh, he succeeded in finding his, uh, her, or he discovered the calling when he first had an interaction with uh, Gopal Krishna Gokhale, and, and he was active with the servants of India society. But neither then nor later did he entertain any thought of joining it. He didn't join that, but he was kind of, uh, interested uh, or kind of carried away by the ideas which uh, Gopal Krishna Gokhale was uh, kind of propagating. Meantime, in in, in I think uh, in the late nineteen uh, early nineteen twenties, um, I forget, forgot the year. Uh, Jawaharlal got married to Kamla Kaul, and his father Motilal Nehru in the same year had hosted. Mahatma Gandhi, uh, while he came to Allahabad, because uh, that was a time Gandhi was going around India. Uh, and uh, there were two important encounters. I think uh, we need to talk about that too. Uh, two important encounters which actually transformed uh, Nehru's perspectives about life. The first one, as I said, was his meeting with Mahatma Gandhi. and, and, and in the early 1920s, he was leading a uh, first uh, nationwide movement. And uh, Motilal Nehru was a major figure in the town in Allahabad. And most often, uh, Gandhi used to stay with them. And Jawaharlal was blown off his feet by Mr. Gandhi. Uh, rather, Gandhi gave Nehru a meaning and purpose in life. And those meetings with Mahatma Gandhi made his resolve that uh, he would dedicate the rest of his life uh, for a cause which is larger than you know doing a, a, a job of a, of a of a lawyer yeah so i think uh, I'm, I'm slightly drifting from uh, from the topic uh, but then here there are contexts which makes a person you know uh, at this stage uh, the freedom struggle had three wings of of or rather three uh, approaches of, of fighting against the British. One was the moderate. They, they believed in incremental and slow progress. They used to make requests. They used to write polite letters to the British. You, you call it the petition politics you know, of the elite. On the other side, there was this radical group uh, you know, who took arms to uh, fight against the Britishers. They, they, they wanted to terrify the Britishers and make them leave India. But Gandhi was neither a moderate nor, a, nor an extremist. His strategy was entirely different. It was something noble, uh, that of non-violence, non of, of not cooperating, uh, but at the same time doing the protest peacefully. You know? the, the, the Satyagraha was a noble concept. So this restless Nehru actually got inspired by this idea, which is neither extremist nor a moderate. and. Uh, despite the fact that his father motilal nehru was a moderate he didn't go uh, you know with in fact there, there is a very interesting conversation and and in one of the correspondence uh, nehru had written uh, to his father that you are immoderately moderate i mean you can't fight british with your 
kind of uh, petition politics. So uh, this uh, 26, 27 year old Jarlal gets fascinated by the novelty, the kind of aura, which is uh, the, the, the charm of Gandhian ideologies. And he joins Indian National Congress, uh, which at that time was more of a movement than a political party, which I'm, I'm sure all of you know, and, 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 to, and he became an active member. And Nehru rose to several leadership positions, in, uh, including the president. And as time passed, it was actually the Jalinwala Bagh incident in 1919, which brought Nehru into a more intense political contact with Gandhi. He sensed in Gandhi a sort of a revolutionary uh, uh, a leader, a revolutionary force in action. You know, and Gandhi, he he reflected was uh, always thinking of the mass mind of India. And Gandhi to Nehru was off and for the people. I mean, that's how he perceived Gandhi. That's the kind of an image uh, which he had about Gandhi. Now, now the second major encounter. I mean, the first one I said was was uh, when Gandhi used to visit Allahabad and when uh, Motilal used to host him is the first interaction which changed uh, or uh, no, the, the, the trajectory had changed. The second was encounter was a Kisan Satyagraha, which happened in uh, in UP, a place called Patpargan, uh, no, Pratab, Pratabgad. And uh, there uh, a person called uh, Baba Ramchandar had mobilized the farmers to fight against the feudal system. And then there was this Motorana and Hatiana. You know, taxes were levied for if a, uh, a feudal lord had to uh, buy a new car, he would levy the taxes. And if 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 if, if a person had to uh, buy a new Hathi, there is a tax called Hatiana. So there were there was the uh, uh, this was the first uh, encounter of Nehru uh, by. Uh, Baba Ramchandar fighting against all the inequalities. You know, he 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 came across people, the real troubles, the poverty, the destitute, the the, the exploitation that was happening in the society. So, uh, in most of the references which I have come across, in fact, uh, Guha is the one who Ramchandra Guha is the one who emphasizes on on these two encounters, uh, which actually changed the mindset of of, of Nehru. And uh, 1921 was extraordinary for Nehru because uh, he became the rising star of Congress party um, through Nehru's pragmatic approach and leadership and non-cooperation movement. He rose to become the general secretary of uh, the Indian National Congress. Now, meantime, the Chauri Chara incident happens. Nehru remains loyal to Gandhi and he did not join the Swaraj party formed by his father, Motilal Nehru, as I, I think I, I mentioned that earlier as well. And he was considering the larger interest of the country. As I said, Congress at that time was a movement and not a party. And by the age 40, Nehru had come to be recognized by his colleagues in the freedom struggle as a, as a man with a lot of qualities, as a man with superior qualities. You know, he was adored by the masses as a, as a glorious prince, by the Britishers as a leader to be reckoned with and was also crowned by the Indian National Congress as a uh, as, as their president. So uh, and I think this occasion was also significant for his father, uh, Motilal Nehru, as it was the first time in the history of Congress that uh, the son had succeeded his father as president, you know, whatever. And, and Motilal had said, whatever the father was unable to accomplish, the son would the <laughs> the son would achieve any. I think one thing which we should also mention here is I don't know whether this should be referred to as the commencement of the dynasty politics, uh, but uh, Motilal, I mean, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru uh, succeeded Motilal uh, in, in, in becoming the, the president of uh, Indian National Congress. Now, before Gandhi came, Congress was a party of, of, of the middle class, the lawyers, the doctors, the professors. But Gandhi brought um, peasants, the workers, the, 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 the women, the artisans into the freedom struggle. So, so it was actually a blend of both. 
the gandhi's aura and nehru's campaigning worked in tandem and, and, and in the interest of the uh, of the congress party i think it is history is always like that it works in in with two people i mean so is the case today yeah um, and and that's why even uh, uh, i remember a, um, a lawyer from mumbai had mentioned that nehru is like a, a bradman for indian national congress because whichever batch uh, bradman used to pay uh, he used to score 100 and right? <laughs> that's how <clears throat> nehru used to win every election that he had contested so it was actually a a jugalbandi of both uh, uh, nehru as also um, gandhi in making congress uh, a movement against uh, the the britishers now in the course of time i think there were three people who had evolved uh, as the trimurtis of congress one was rajagopal achari another was uh, sardar vallabhbhai patel and th- the third one obviously was nehru and uh, they were referred to as the head uh, heart and the hand of congress party rajagopal achari as you know was an intellect you know he was fairly intelligent you know he's the one who had translated ramayana and mahabharata into english and he also later became the first and probably the last uh, uh, indian born governor general of india nehru on the other hand was the heart because he had this personal charisma and uh, his ability to genuinely empathize and connect with people and that actually drove more people towards congress which probably is also the reason why he was made the prime minister i mean that's still debated why was nehru chosen over patel i mean that's something which i mean i'll i'll, I'll if time permits i'll let's speak about that as well now sardar patel evolved as the hand rather the hardcore practitioner to organize uh, execute meetings rallies and you know events for the congress party and his abilities along with i think uh, vp man and we have seen you know later when he pioneered uh, the integration of the princely states post independence so what i'm trying to put forth is that there was a culture of give and take among the leaders while also realizing and also respecting the the inherent qualities of the potential in each other now in 19 i'm not very sure 1935 or 36 nehru uh, ailing wife dies in, in in a sanatorium in switzerland and later nehru's visit to europe proved to be a sort of a watershed in in his political and economic thinking because nehru represents uh, the left wing of congress you no know? his real interest in marxism and his sort of uh, socialistic um a socialistic pattern of 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 thinking all is known to have evolved during this tour and uh, his yardstick of economic thinking remained marxist i would say but i would uh, tweak tweak or adjust it where necessary to the indian conditions and that's also one of the reasons why he is still getting targeted yeah now nehru started raising several reason and seasoned arguments for the political discourse of that time many of which i believe is still very relevant because meantime he had started a, a newspaper a national herald and uh, he had started raising his voice of dissent while also encouraging and giving confidence for a lot of other people also to do so so look at the kind of roles dif- different roles it's not just about leader or, or just being the first prime minister as a journalist as a, a building confidence in people now as a prime minister the negotiations between congress and the separatist uh, muslim league for power sharing had failed and, and that gave way to independence and the, the, the bloody partition uh, in, in 1947 but uh, though they were trimurtis functioning all of them were functioning in tandem as they had as i mentioned as the head heart and hand post independence it was upon the suggestion of mahatma gandhi that nehru took over the post of prime minister because 
as early as 1930s mahatma gandhi had uh, re while referring to nehru and patel had already said my political mantle uh, my political mantle will rest not rust uh, my political mantle will rest on their shoulders they, which means they will succeed me uh, no pointing at uh, uh, nehru and patel so but shortly after independence nehru and patel started having disagreements but even in their disagreements they both had agreed to disagree i mean there are uh, you know enough of literatures between the correspondence that which had happened between patel and nehru uh, which is there uh, in in as as repositories uh, so patel though this cab, uh, <clears throat> this uh, cabinet system where prime minister uh, was considered as the first among equals and nehru in return had thought that uh, as a prime minister he would oversee what his colleagues were doing but actually the differences did continue however i think uh, uh, while being alive gandhi may not have resolved the, the 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 rift or the conflict between them but upon his death he could because on 30th of jan uh, 1948 Uh, after gandhi's assassination by uh, a religious fanatic uh, there were uh, there were several conversations and exchanges of letters in the first week of 1948 and between them and uh, these are available in the in the in the, in the archives of of the published works of sardar patel and uh, and most of those letters solidly stated that it is a time for both of them to the work in tandem and 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 considering the larger interest of the country of course nehru was uh, for sure as as gandhi's protege but um, why was nehru chosen by gandhi as a successor than patel uh, than patel from gujarat or let's say uh, rajagopala jari as a southern commander a thinker a scholar or than maulana azad uh, who was a, a muslim a follower and a scholar but or or or, or as another leader um, dr rajendra prasad from bihar when I mean, there are at least half a dozen options uh, from whom gandhi could have chosen a successor but this be, being still debated there are several reasons why uh, why not others you know among gandhi's followers i think nehru was the least parochial because uh, patel was seen as a gujarati Rajgopal Acharya was seen as a as a Tamil, Rajendra Prasad was seen as a Bihari, but Nehru has a pan Indian experience of traveling across and also uh, you know global exposure. And Nehru was was a Hindu trusted by Muslims, a man who believed in equal rights for women, a North Indian who believed that South India was was a crucial part. Nehru was also someone who believed that one does not have to be a Hindu to be a patriot, or someone uh, who believed that uh, one did not have to be speaking Hindi to be a patriotic Indian or a proud Indian. So Nehru was a person who had acknowledged that uh, India as a country has its strength and its diversity. so this non parochial pan indian nature of uh, nehru's personality i think is what considered or what gave him an edge over other people and uh, however others also did have great attributes i'm i'm not i'm not discounting that uh, nehru had this international exposure uh, to his advantage and then uh, as i said had this universal image and acceptance so nehru was someone who had understood india's place in the world not like india's place uh, in 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 frog in the well kind of a very nationalistic approach but he was charismatic appealing for the youth he was a wonderful communicator a narrator um, and and a lot of other i think factors did uh, uh, go in his favor however there is uh, uh, there is a tendentious representation of rivalry between nehru and patel which narrative is still continue uh, you know been propagated through several media platforms uh, at a point when congress i mean <laughs> this is very interesting observation um, about uh, nehru 
and Patel, at a point when Congress party had disowned Patel, is when another party has misowned Patel. Yeah. But till uh, the, the, the death of Patel in 1960, they both actually did work solidly together and they, they both created a, and crafted a partnership in which uh, each person knew what the other person was better at. And their friendship and commitment were based on the strength and weakness, uh, which were closely and, and in, in, intensely appreciated the qualities in each other. And, and I think uh, I was reading uh, another uh, uh, literature in which it says it was Nehru who had initiated discussions to bring Patel's children, thereby Patel and, um, and, and Mani Ben, if I'm not wrong, to contest elections and thereby join parliamentary politics. But of course, uh, thereby did leave Congress later following his disagreements with Nehru. But what I wish to mention again about Nehru's ability is to set a culture of trust, respect, despite having dis differences in whatever they aspired and pursued. And, and I think these are important lessons even today. Uh, you know, when we look at the perspectives of our times, uh, where there is partisan, abusive identity politics of hatred, uh, you know, polarizing uh, divisive tactics in, in, in politics. So the lesson is how to work together and respect each other's differences. You know, uh, Tarur always, uh, Shashi Tarur always says, I respect your truth as much I expect you to respect my truth. And it's about being in coherence with multiple versions of truth that people believe in. Now, another thing which is extremely important and needs to be understood is the way the first cabinet was constituted. When Nehru constituted the first cabinet in independent and free India, Ambedkar, who was a great adversary of Nehru, Patel, Gandhi, the Congress party, finds a place in the ministry, despite being not a member of the Congress party. And that was an extraordinary act of generosity. This was with due respect to what Mahatma Gandhi had told well in advance. See, the independence is not coming to India. It is, sorry, ind independence is coming to India and not to the Congress party. This is quite unlike today because and when, if it's Congress or BJP or if, if, if the left wins, the whole cabinet today is from the same party. In contrary to, to this, the first cabinet, it's, it's amazing. It was unanimously decided that the first cabinet must have the best of the minds, regardless of the political affinity. In fact, if possible, from all, all the parties. And that is why you find Shanmugham Shetty from Madras, who becomes the first uh, finance minister. And he was a, a lifelong opponent of Congress party, but he found a place in, in, in the first cabinet. You have Akali Baldev Singh from Punjab representing the Sikh community. He became the defense minister. Then you have a cabinet minister where Shyamu Prasad Mukherjee of the Hindu Mahasabha, he later found uh, Jan Sang. He was also an opponent of the Congress party above all, a, a critic of Nehru and Ambedkar. In fact, to get Ambedkar to uh, represent the assembly, Patel uh, gets another Congress uh, man to resign his seat. And later, Ambedkar gets nominated to his place. So that's how Ambedkar <coughs> becomes the first law minister. And that's how he spearheads the, the, the drafting of, of, of the Indian constitution. So, the constitution of India gets enacted after which uh, Nehru embarked on the ambitious programs of economic uh, and social and political reforms. Again, I'm, I'm slightly uh, a quick deter here. In 2008, <coughs> uh, Barack Obama, an African American, became the, 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 the president of uh, United States of America. But 60 years before, something as radical and as remarkable had happened in our country. You know, a sociologist would say that the, the system of caste in our countries is actually comparable with the system of race in the, in, in, in the US. You know, the stigmatization of the African-Americans, the blacks, their confinement to 
very menial, servile, and degrading professions. It is exactly comparable to the traditional Indian society. And Ambedkar, one among the Dalits, as Gandhi used to call them, uh, from this lesser privileged sections of our society, long before Obama had broken the glass ceiling in the US, had become the cabinet minister, spearheaded the drafting of constitution as well. Though I've drawn parallels with the history of US, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to uh, talk about the broad mindedness and the openness, the accommodation uh, that was set in the larger interest of the country than any sectarian uh, or uh, any personal or, or, or political gains. So another interesting thing is this ministry had 70% of those in the cabinet with a PhD. So the first cabinet was a mark of how far-sighted Nehru, Patel, Gandhi, and, and so many of, of those leaders of those times had respected and had thought in the larger interest of the country than any political interest or personal interest. And Nehru and Patel, while carving out a new India, had, as I said, a, a, a great Jugal Bandi, uh, which, uh, which had done good for, uh, for this country. Um, though there are numerous things we are indebted to Nehru, I would love to argue and reiterate that democracy and democratic institution building is the most fundamental contribution which I think we need to lay at the feet of Nehru, to which uh, he deserves huge respect. Because uh, it has to be acknowledged and emphasized. Why? Because he had the power, he had the popularity, he had the opportunity to do exactly the opposite, but which he did not do. You know, if you look at the examples of leaders of anti-colonial struggles who brought in their nation to freedom and then had, had actually turned to dictators. You have uh, Kwame of Ghana, you have uh, uh, Kwanda of Zambia, Nirare of, of um, Tanzania. I mean, there are so many examples. In fact, our neighbors, Pakistan, which was explicitly formed on the basis of religion, became a country of military dictatorship. You know, and, and, and people jokingly say that while India has general elections, uh, our neighbor has election of generals. No, which I think which still continues. Nepal, for that matter, became a monarchy. Bangladesh had recurring political instabilities until you know, recently. China had become a one-party totalitarian communist state. So independent countries free uh, from the clutches of uh, colonial rule, except, China, uh, except Sri Lanka. Democracy did not take root. But Sri Lanka is, of, in a, is an official Buddhist state with Sinhala as their official language, for which they had to pay a price with their continuing ethnic and civil unrest. So the greatness of the founding fathers is that they were in fascist dictators, and this country was not reduced to a single language, nor to a single religion or an ethnic group, which the leaders of those of our times are attempting hard to. And that in itself ranks Nehru not only as a great Indian, but also as a great world leader. Now, how much time do I have? I think I would need at least another 20 minutes to, to uh, because uh, I should do justice to your time as well. Uh, actually, sir, maybe another Sorry. Uh, three to four minutes. <laughs> yeah, because Hello, sir. How much time do you have? Uh, it's only time, one o'clock, but uh, maybe some 10 minutes of discussion, 10 minutes. Okay, I'll take another 10 minutes to kind of wrap up my, um, because there are uh, a few things which I wanted to conclude. Uh, so can I take uh, 10 minutes in, in wrapping up my, my thoughts? All right, all right. So um, I think I should be focusing on um, some of the major contributions of 
uh, Nehru for which he should be, um, you know, um, probably five core philosophies uh, which uh, for which uh, Nehruvian, uh, which should be credited as the Nehruvian contribution in building the foundation of modern India. One, educational, economic, and infrastructure modernization. You know, he believed in cutting edge scientific research temperament for uh, for the people, and by creating an infrastructure for advancement of science in higher education, which is crucial in a modern world, uh, had actually helped in enhancing our productivity and alleviating diseases and poverty that was once, or at the time of of, of independence, quite rampant. So he also used to attend the science congress during his term which made it obligatory for the for her successors also to follow this year so there are enormous number of institutions which you can give credit to the planning commission the national chemical laboratory the indian institute of technology indian institute of medical science steel authority of india Bilai steel plant the oil and natural gas corporation isro and, and i think you can take the iits the ifrs i mean none of the neighboring countries had any of these yeah so Nehru, in fact, wanted the dams and, and, and the, the, the factories as the new temples of the modern India, as he put it. So I think the first credit, uh, I'm, I'm just summarizing my, my thoughts uh, into five points. Number one is the educational, economic, and infrastructure modernization. Second is about social equality. Now, providing equal opportunities for all citizens, and especially his battle and uh, for equality of, of peasants, zamindars, are, are something which we need to be giving credit. Uh, South Indians respect Nehru because he did not impose Hindi on them. He realized that the, the regional pride of languages and understood that English could be a neutral language. Yeah, English was also a language as a window to the world for scientific fraternities as well. So I think that's another social equality. Uh, and the third one, and which is extremely important, I need to flag that point as well, which is the gender equality. Probably in a liberal world that we live in today, uh, this may not sound a challenge, but at least the educated Indians today take it for granted. But uh, given the case uh, post-independence when women were oppressed uh, and deeply conservative and patriarchal, women did not have a right to choose their marriage partners. If one person had to be sent to college, it was only men. Um, you know, they didn't inherit property men can divorce and remarry, women cannot divorce and remarry, all kinds of restrictionism uh, with there. And it is at this moment that uh, Nehru intru introduces the Hindu personal law, you know, at least by law. You know, while such a leadership um, um, had, had thought about uh, at least bringing in a law, how much in practice is, however, kind of debatable, I mean, we can discuss, but at least by law, uh, he had brought in some sort of a reform among women as well. The fourth one is about the internationalization, the relationship which he had built with uh, the countries, uh, uh, you know, and, and especially when we had to go with the non-aligned uh, forces. Uh, there's a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, the John Foster Duller, the former uh, US secretary, uh, had at once asked uh, Nehru, I mean, uh, just to tell you the context, you had two uh, bigger countries to be aligned with. One was the, the then USSR and the other one was uh, USA. And he asked Nehru, are you with us or against us? And Nehru said, yes. I mean, in other words, we are with you when we agree with you and we are not with you when we don't when we, <laughs> when we disagree with you. So that's the kind of diplomatic uh, no, no, kind of shrewdness or cleverness which he had uh, in, in maintaining the relationship that's so that's internationalization is also another thing and the last one is the the deeply entrenched religious pluralism and democracy uh, you know open elections freedom of press independence of the court and so many uh, other things while he personally was an agnostic his secularism wasn't about uh, i mean not the dictionary definition of uh, a secularism not the denial of religion but it was practice more of a plurality of, of or inclusivity 
or a pluralism is, is would be a better word to define his definition of of secularism so i think these are some of the five uh, you know if i can say five major uh, you know contributions uh, well uh, nehru of course is not uh, a man without blemishes and not a person to be written off as well um, some of his uh, critics do say that uh, nehru did not encourage private enterprises uh, and which led to a slowdown in growth but i think given the circumstances then um, so a socialistic approach was a little more feasible is what he, his team had sought uh, had thought about and uh, people also talk about the unresolved issue of kashmir which still continues uh, to, to remain a, a kind of a flashpoint between india and pakistan uh, besides this criticism i think nehru was questioned uh, about his naive uh, uh, attitude towards china and their intentions nehru was a bit romantic or, or rather uh, starry eyed uh, with, with the most powerful and the wicked neighbor again we are uh, we, we continue to uh, you know have the consequences of it uh, but then i think there are a couple of things which uh, we should also mention here is about his lack of attention to primary education i mean those are not the things which nehru should be criticized for uh, nehru should, uh, gave a lot of importance for higher education you get to see a lot of higher education institution but the primary education and his uh, head was kind of not much emphasized is what i think uh, we need to look at because a lot of social economic cultural problems of caste and gender uh, would have got minimized had there been more emphasis on uh, you know education is such a powerful tool uh, has there been an emphasis on primary education his commitment to socialism is also being criticized uh, but then i think after 200 years of exploitation uh, the the state had to play a crucial role uh, but then it eventually led to something called state capitalism which uh, later ron raja ji had mentioned that uh, uh, mentioned as uh, the license kota permit raj the, the the bureaucratization of the economy i think those are the things which probably he didn't have in mind but when it comes to it came to practice um, um, uh, it didn't uh, you know give the results which probably they would have thought about one last thing before i think uh, i take up a few questions is it is also wrong to discredit him for the alleged charges of dynasty politics by the successors in his family because when nehru died in 1964 indira gandhi was prepared to migrate to london where his children were studying and it wasn't indira gandhi who succeeded nehru immediately after they had there was general elections and it was lal bahadur shastri who got elected democratically to uh, an election so the criticism that he started political uh, or dynasty politics is i would say utter nonsense it was the congress party workers who dragged rather compelled indira gandhi to get into the politics time and again nehru is vilified today for his biological descendants yeah as i said uh and, and and i think apart from his genes uh, one wouldn't find anything in common in his daughter in his grandson or currently in his great grandson you know nehru's posthumous reputation was and is uh, ruined by the misdeeds of his successors and one should not confuse the dynasty with jawarlal nehru i mean that's uh, you know there is a biblical verse which says the sins of the father will be will be on 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 seven generations but in in nehru's case the sins of the generations is on the father <laughs> that's the uh, i think uh, quite an irony which has happened so uh, i'm 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 saying what i'm trying to say is uh, nehru of course is not a man without blemishes um, and one thing which he should not have done is that uh, he stayed too long Uh, you know according to a lot of historians and he shouldn't have stayed that long he succumbed to the vanity and the weakness of 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 the long serving especially the 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 male leaders they start thinking that they are immortal and inconquerable and if you look at that's why i said 1962 has has been a really bad time for nehru 
since 1962 till his death because most of his failures corruption charges against his ministry uh, failure with, uh, with a war in a war in, with china uh, dismissal of, of of the democratically elected government in kerala uh, headed by the ms namudripad uh, i mean all of that the, the it, it, it's a dark chapter in his political career and most of his mistakes happened in the last lap of his political life where he lost his focus intentions and energy and this i think is most uh, common mistake among most powerful men um, you know, uh, i still remember ratan tata uh, and varghese kurian they all continued uh, after a point and ratan tata did confess that he shouldn't have continued so uh, during his 11 years in office though in 1958 nehru thought of retirement and had officially sent a resignation expecting his a transition or an organic growth from of leaders from within his party uh, he he had even planned for a holiday to kashmir uh, with that intention but that didn't happen um, in the official records uh, it is said that he 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 was seriously contemplating of giving up the job uh, of prime minister um, you know about 7 uh, or 8 years prior to his death but upon massive public outcry he did take over so um, now uh, one last thing uh, before i take a few questions uh, wells hangen had written a book uh, the uh, and the title is after nehru who but the last i think the, the, the larger question that he was asking is after nehru what because or, or probably what will be the fate of of india after nehru and that in itself talks about the vacuum i think he had left behind I, I, on, on that note i wish to kind of give a pause and uh, i as i said i'm not an expert i am I'm just having an interest in this topic uh, and love reading about nehru and and the philosophies and the ideas which guided him and which i believe is still very relevant uh thank you for the rishis for the insightful talk i i personally really enjoyed the talk and now the floor is open for questions and interaction thanks professor for this uh, a very you know uh, enlightening talk uh, you know i have few few disagreements with what you said the first dis disagreement is with the uh, association of nehru with the leftist congress and there has been you know vast amount of literature on that which shows that he was pretty much you know opposed to the leftist part of the congress you may argue this based on the that he was a leftist based on what he did after the independence regarding the socialist socialism centralization and all but that had deeper motives which was the unity of the india which is the first philosophy pointed out by biko parekh the first philosophy of uh, nehru was integration and all of those you know uh, ideals of mm, centralization fire plans modernization they were meant to promote this national unity in that sense i mean he was not a leftist there were some uh, you know deeper motives behind those the other one is that he said that you know this uh, allegation of uh, dynastic politics i mean there has been again very tremendous literature on that by rajni kothari stanley kochanek and all who argue that if he had not like uh, he had not chosen a successor in that sense you may like you may say that he was a dynastic politics but within the congress structure itself he had not developed that much of you know that mechanism that would ensure that you know the 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 leader uh, of the successor his successor did not represent his own family he had not developed that kind of mechanism you see <clears throat> regarding this cult of personality that he created within the congress that created a vacuum of leadership so like even now we say what after modi this was a uh, common talk those days what after nehru because his cult of personality had you know overshadowed the whole congress 
and though there were this uh, there were these sections that sectionalism within the congress that promoted their own leaders uh, like lal bahadur shastri or within the congress uh, o sanjeev reddy etc that led to the 1969 split so this uh, phase of indira gandhi this came up only because when nehru had not left any mechanism within the congress system to choose a leader in a fair way so that is these are the two disagreements and i come to more points later all right so uh, the first uh, uh, observation is that uh, nehru was a leftist my definition of leftist is you know uh, if you go to uh, calcutta i mean we used to go for interviews um, almost every every year at least twice or thrice what i have experienced is kali and karl marx coexist i mean that's how uh, the i mean uh, when we talk about uh, leftism i'm not talking about the dictionary definition of de- uh, leftism i mean it's blended with the ethos of and the cultures and the values of uh, the land which we are living in is is what he has practiced it is not complete denial of uh, of a religion or the complete acceptance my point was he was a leftist with uh, he believed or rather uh, a lot of leftist ideologies were influenced in his thoughts and and, and actions uh, within uh, despite being a congress person that's number one number two uh, what was your observation about uh, I forgot your second question. Yeah, so, you okay. said that that dynasty politics and nonsense, but this is pretty much what other you know um, experts on this area are saying that yeah, he created a dynasty politics, if not knowingly, but unknowingly in a in a in a subtle sense. I I, I completely agree with that, and this happens with uh, as I said uh, in all uh, the leaders who think they are immortal, and look at what happened uh, after Jayalalitha's death uh, in 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 Tamil Nadu. I mean, there is no second line that is uh, that is created. I mean, uh, same thing is likely to happen in in West Bengal. I mean, uh, I, I completely empath. I mean, I agree with your observation that uh, the uh, his attempts uh, should have been to create a second line or a uh, you know a succession planning wasn't done. And but uh, I mean, in talks or in his lectures or in his writings, he was once asked. you know would you uh, would you would your uh, anyone from your family would uh, or what is your vision about india he said i wanted 400 billion indians to be capable of uh, guiding or uh, ruling themselves and that's the vision he had i mean it was about larger interest of of, of the country but as you rightly said uh, he should have done a little more to find Uh, or create a space for more leaders to organically evolve within congress party which hasn't evolved which hasn't happened yeah, and there is like a lot of contradictions what he wrote and what he said i mean regarding whether it was regarding kashmir or whether whether it was uh, regarding nagaland or all I mean, there are like serious contradictions and ambivalences in his thought uh, and also like his what this was what she meant to say that he lost the touch with the ground uh, when he you know criticizes his notion of secularism and there are like many those uh, and and also about the industrialization and the uh, centralization of the indian uh, political system whose implications and you know consequences we are now um, dealing with Okay. Thank you uh, for that question. Uh, actually, uh, uh, when you asked that question, I was reminded of uh, Mahatma Gandhi's. I mean, uh, George Orwell's reflections on Mahatma Gandhi that you know saints should be proved guilty first before they are, uh, you know, evaluated. But the attitude should should be different. So yes, there are many notions, ways in which uh, you know, critiqued. So we could take another, um, maybe another two, three, maybe two three questions more. Uh, Uh, thank you uh, mr adil for the questions and thank you sir for the response um, thank you sir you can also keep uh, adding on to the points that we have discussed not necessarily a question if there yes, is anything yes. that i missed out that's also welcome yes yes 
Uh, uh, Dr. Srijit has a question. Uh, Dr. Yeah, Srijit, yes, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Not a question. Uh, and thank you, Rishikesh, sir. Uh, Srijit, for a wonderful talk. Yeah, hi, sir. Yeah. yeah, it's not a question. Just to add one more thing, you know, I think uh, Nehru, being a lover of literature, uh, he knew very well about the significance of symbolism mm -hmm. in the life. And, uh, and what is what I'm reminded of is one incident which happened. Uh, while uh, he was returning from London, he had a he got a request from Mussolini to meet him uh, somewhere in Germany or Italy, uh, but he denied it. And the irony is, Gandhiji had met him, had met uh, Mussolini and had a chat with him. But Nehru was very, very uh, 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 what is an obstinate not to meet Mussolini. Not because that he would go into a fight with Mussolini, verbal fight or anything, but he knew very well that that would give a wrong signal to the people in the country. Yeah, uh, and the, uh, Gandhiji was not, uh, yes. was not serious about it. So yes. th then itself he knew about the about the consequences of such a meeting with a person like Mussolini or Hitler, anyone. I mean, you know that I mean his reading or his exposure to literature or philosophy or political theory, which he learned from his London days would have helped him uh, to understand that. In fact, I think in turn helped Nehru to understand the, the, the society, Indian society uh, with all its diversity. Uh, when you read Discovery of India, that's what we feel from his reading. And he called India as the collection of people not not in terms of the territorial boundaries or anything but uh, the, the people of india is india for me he very uh, reiteratedly uh, telling in his discovery of india so that that con that consciousness about the future of the country was very very pertinent very very uh, conspicuous in in nehru's life throughout i believe yes yes but at the same time at the same time one more thing at the same time i'm very uh, baffled by his uh, decision to dis uh, dismiss kerala government in 1959 uh, and uh, what 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 i heard that it was insistence from indira gandhi <laughs> uh, to take such a decision but still i am not able to digest how a person like nehru could such uh, take such a foolish decision such a such a stupid decision to dismiss a democratic uh, democratically elected government in Kerala then. So, uh, so two sides of Nehru's face. <laughs> I think, uh, as I said, uh, the most of his uh, wrong decision, wh wherever he had gone wrong, uh, it was mostly after or close to 1960s, uh, during, uh, you know, uh, prior to one or two years uh, prior to his death. And uh, as you said, uh, Ms. Rijit, sir, I think the, the line which is mentioned, if I remember correctly, is I'm not ready to shake hands with someone uh, who's, with whose philosophy I completely disagree with. Is what the statement exactly is. exactly say. He didn't want to shake hands with Mussolini. You're right, sir. And 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 to our dismay, Gandhiji met him. Uh, <laughs> still an enigmatic person for me, Gandhiji. <laughs> Very confusing. Sir, that could be a pure accident. You know? I mean, you meet somebody that doesn't mean you uh, you ingratiate yourself with that philosophy. No, no. Understand. I mean, uh, uh, understanding the consequence, uh, the symbolic consequences of such an action is very important for a leader. Okay. And uh, I mean, that's. I think that's how you began your question. That the symbolism, how important it is. Yeah. Uh, that that that. Actually, would be actually what uh, Dr. Srijit asked, I had a similar kind of observation. Uh, I was uh, uh, really uh, amazed to read uh, Jawaharlal Nehru's uh, uh, correspondence with Andre Moldrow. For example, uh, uh, he was uh, repre representing France, and he called, and uh, and 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 there in that conversation also you see that Jawaharlal Nehru was not quite drawn to any kind of extremes uh, in, in in his conduct. However, I have a I have an add-on question. You, as I just um, you know, I, I alluded to George Orwell. That you know, you see these contradictions in this in the in the, in the lives of great uh, human beings, great men. So uh, here, on one hand, uh, you have Jawaharlal Nehru, who is not uh, drawn to any extremes. That is w one thing. And on the other hand, uh, you say that he uh, imbibes the best of uh, socialism. But how would Nehru really react to, uh, if he was alive, to uh, uh, to uh, situations where uh, you see? I personally see that you know left parties 
somehow are quite soft on some religions very very soft they are very selective when it comes to you know uh, in critiquing certain religions but they are very soft on certain religions but maybe i don't know maybe they are afraid or something i don't know why but they, but they are not quite harsh how would jawala nehru react to such situation let me just say because these two people jawala nehru and uh, jadu krishna murthy these two people they represent the composite culture without using the uh, peculiar language that indians use but they use a different idiom altogether but they represent the composite culture which is a gift of this culture i mean i mean i mean no wonder we, when we talk about uh, you know vichara uh, in the concept note it note itself i refer to uh, the the composite culture of india uh, one of the representatives is the uh, the uh, the jain uh, notion of anekantavada where you 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 talk about the non absolutistic position so on one hand he is uh, uh, you know a passionate socialist at one point and on the other hand you see socialists are quite soft on some religions and the extremist extremism of those religions how would jawala nehru negotiate with these contradictions i'm sure uh, see i uh, would also agree with uh, uh, the fact that uh, communists or the left parties uh, have so many other contradictions too because uh, you know uh, they for them uh, every time uh, the uh, their nationalism is some other country not the country which they i mean for them it's either a cuba for once it was cuba a model for some other time it is china a model i mean even in their in, uh, na- national conferences uh, it is it is you don't uh, you rarely get to see the images of indian figures i mean there are so many uh, contradictions and that's one of the reasons why they keep uh, getting targeted by uh, the the opposite yeah so uh, i think uh, nehru uh, as um, uh, Uh, your point was uh, how would you how would nehru perceive uh, how would how would nehru really negotiate with these contradictions uh, because huh. on one hand he he he, he champions a, a, a certain dimension of socialism but on the other hand we see in india the indian version of it where you know if you are critiquing religion it, it should be across the board it shouldn't you shouldn't go you know to see put on certain extremism of, of certain religions Okay. Okay. Got it. So, if you yeah. if you want me to tell an honest answer, the honest answer is that I don't know. But if you want me to tell tell an answer, the answer is that see, uh, um, even uh, that's exactly what happened uh, or led to partition. There too, I mean, uh, it, it was again, uh, you know, religion being uh, becoming the the, the 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 epicenter of the conversation where they couldn't reach on a consensus, but. one thing i'm sure is he would uh, nehru would had he been alive he would be willing to uh, have uh, open discussions where uh, he would listen to uh, you know every version of the story i mean that's what i feel you know he he's a person who's uh, who i mean going by whatever we have read or what we have come across he would listen to all sides or all versions of the story and try to reach on a consensus which of course in several other cases he didn't succeed in but uh, i i feel he would be more, more than uh, willing to do a, such a debate or a discussion thank you sir uh, yeah like uh, i would like to add a point here that you know uh, ashish nandi he characterized nehru as a person who was neither religious in private sphere nor in public sphere and the use of the non religious idioms it is best uh, you know uh, characterized by his arguments on the uh, cow protection when he like he uh, he dissuaded from the position of the hindu hindu nationalist who said that well, this is uh, uh, this is cow is revered in our religion and based on religious arguments we should you know prohibit it is uh, slaughter but he has said no this is th- this will not be permitted in my india Uh, we cannot use religious arguments to mm-hmm. you know uh, to push policies through but mm-hmm. you know he gave the uh, arguments based on uh, this economic benefits of cow regarding this because he was like uh, he was uh, uh, he, he had uh, embarked on a path of modernization so he said that cow will be very useful in uh, in in that process in the sense that like in dairy industries mm-hmm. so he gave the then he it was put in the director principles of state policy so here we see like how he mediated between the 
religious and secular credentials uh, that he was like uh, into into those uh, uh, issues yeah thank you thank you adil for your uh, comments uh, maybe one or two questions more Uh, so can I say uh, say something? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, so yeah, listening all to the discussions of what Nehru did, what Nehru haven't, what Nehru said, and what Nehru haven't. Like one thing which I want to point out is uh, uh, the period in which Nehru have ruled, especially from after independence for sixteen years and seventeen years as prime minister. I think all he have done is. Um, that passes his imperfections right nehru is bigger than the totality of his imperfections and some of the discussions which we are having here like picking up uh, a quote what nehru said and even what nehru said right but i think nehru is bigger figure than 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 all of this figures right he, he he himself is a man of multiple paradoxes and man of counterfactuals like if today something said is nehru might have said something tomorrow nehru might have said something but i think what we should appreciate is the movement of nehru and regarding um, and and i think nehru is unfairly scapegoated for some of his failures of his time right because uh, sk patel then agriculture minister once said that nehru is like a banyan tree under which everything will take the shadow but nothing grows under it so at the same time he could be scapegoated so i think one thing which i which we should appreciate is that he is bigger than of any of imperfections which might have said and he himself is a man of counterfactuals and to be man is to her right being in that position i think we have to give some uh, credit to him for all these things such a passing his uh, multiple failures yeah uh, rishwan actually see the point is we are having a discussion here because you know, indians are quite quite uh, easily given to his geographies so we are trying to decode nehru without delete his contributions uh, in the sense you know i mean i, I mean that i mean you don't have to if you like somebody that doesn't mean you have to critical of that person i mean all things are individually into over when you take out one strand the other strands come out so we are not trying to really uh, you know uh, belittle his importance you know we are trying to decode his personality you know and that way you know when we point out his uh, you know seeming flaws they in a way uh, make his greatness more prominent uh, that way so and there are lots of uh, stories which i believe are either apocryphal or um, you know uh, yeah. propaganda which goes in and so i think the conversations or discussions like this is what would bust such kind of myth or false fake news which gets you know circulated so i i just if there aren't any questions i would just suggest two or three books which i found interesting and you know to know more about if you find it interesting one is about one is by survey uh, survey uh, palli gopal uh, he had written jarlal nehru biography i mean it's it's incredible i would say it's quite voluminous but then it's it's really incredible and uh, there's another book which is uh, of course a short no one written by an australian uh, diplomat and and the name uh, the title is the nehru of contemporary estimate i mean and that's a little more because uh, he had close interaction with nehru uh, and that's it's it, uh, that's another uh, beautiful book and uh, the last suggestion uh, probably is to read nehru himself because you know incredible books he has written during his 10 uh, almost 10 years of his prison life the discovery of india and the glimpses of most of which was in the form of conversation letters to his uh, yeah Uh, so yeah so discovery of india uh, and the glimpses of world history uh, i mean those are amazing uh, to understand there are no substitute uh, to understand uh, nehru better so yeah, that's actually actually many there are some historians who believe that his glimpses of world history uh, singularly uh, proves uh, even ag wells world history insular that way they say because it's mm. so good uh, I have one question, sir. I mean, since nobody is asking, I'm just initiating some discussion. I have a question about uh, you spoke about. I think you alluded to uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri. There are two figures in Congress Party. One is uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. P. V. P. V. Narasimha Rao and Lal Bahadur Shastri. You tell me if it is if it is 
the fake news or uh, really <laughs> there is some element of truth in it that when lal bahadur shastri uh, became the prime minister of india uh, mm-hmm. he was in the uh, i mean there are people in the congress party who was making fun of him of his background and uh, and uh, how he went about uh, his office and uh, his stay in the bhavan so do you think all these are fake news or that is one thing the second thing is that uh, people not being allowed to attend uh, the funeral of uh, mr pv narsimha rao oh. uh, so do you think uh, there is an element of truth in all these speculations uh, i don't know that's the answer actually i don't know okay. both i am not sure okay. so um, any other question uh, so uh, i don't think there are uh, uh, more questions so on behalf of uh, uh, vichara uh, and uh, the department of english uh, we thank you sir uh, for your presence. thank you i must thank you actually and such a such a delightful uh, lecture i think um, maybe you know it's already uh, 136 that's why not many questions because it's lunch time uh, and uh, maybe we have we need to rethink uh, the timings actually maybe you know, maybe we could keep it at 4 o'clock or something so that you know people have more time to interact uh, so thank you very much for this insightful lecture and this, the the discussion can go on and on and also thank you for suggesting the the some of the book titles uh, they are also very important and as a final uh, summing up sir would you like to say something and we could end the meeting uh, uh reshika sir it, it's it's to you as a summing up would you like to say something no i just wanted to say thank you uh, because i'm uh, i'm re- between your lunch and uh, <laughs> no no it was it was delightful to listen to you really it was a delight yeah, the yeah, i would have uh, loved it had it been i mean i i should have kept in mind the time but uh, uh, maybe planned it a little better um, but thank you once again um, biju sir and vidyut sir and the entire department i, I can see hod ma'am shobhna ma'am and so many of my good friends in, in campus uh, whoever has made this event possible thank you very much let's have this and let's have such conversations and also sir also sir maybe we will look forward to uh, a longer session with you maybe in future we'll best we'll do it thank you rishikesh sir it was a wonderful presentation thank you so much thank you very much rishi for being here a lovely session very engaging i have a lot of questions but then i'm sure we can do that over coffee as we usually do so thanks a lot thank you and really hope that you would come back for more deliberations in future thanks a lot thank you very much thank you so vijay sir yes sir so i think uh, we'll do something sir maybe for the next talk we will discuss with the department whether to have it at 12 o'clock or 4 o'clock <laughs> Okay. Uh, Starting eleven thirty, Bidyut, if you can. I mean, just a suggestion. The point is, ma'am, you know, some teachers class are classed. Yes, and also uh, not, not only teachers, even students are engaged. Right, course. right. I forgot. So, Look at me. I forgot that. No, but I think it's very interesting. I don't think anybody minds. You know, I mean, uh, at least now that we're online, I think people can bring their lunch to the meeting. It's not a problem. <laughs> Those who really want. The intention is to make it very informal. Uh-huh. Correct, correct. Yeah. So, however, I think Professor Kennedy is saying something. Oh, Professor Kennedy, sorry, sir. Sorry, He's sir. He's saying something. I can't hear. Yes, sir. I thought I heard him say something. Any, anyway, perhaps it was. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, Bidyut. I have another meeting at two. I, I I wasn't going to say anything, but since you asked me, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I distinctly heard you. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, any, any, no, no, no. I mean, I, it was a wonderful presentation. I think uh, Rishikesh is yes. uh, still here. No. Uh, left. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Rishikesh. It was uh, wonderful, you know, listening to you. Quite a lot of insights. Thank you. And and about the timing, you know, we can always decide later. I mean, no hurry. Yes, uh, we'll look at all the possibilities and then we'll decide. Actually, okay? I, sir, sir, I thought you would be asking questions today. <laughs> no, no. I mean, um, see, questions will always be there. <laughs> right.
as an uh, academician, we are supposed to ask questions, right? So I love to ask questions. But, you know, in general, I think it was a beautiful presentation yes, and uh, a lot of things that we agree upon. Of course. Right. And uh, there may be some differences of opinion here and there, but I think that's our right as academicians, as intellectuals, right? So that's okay. So thanks, Rishikesh, once again. Yeah. Sir, you know that uh, that's it. Raja Rao has this beautiful essay on Jawaharlal Nehru where, uh, you know, he, Jawaharlal Nehru and Andre Molro have a conversation. It's a brilliant mm -hmm. essay, sir. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll scan it and send it to you. Yeah, yeah. send it, send it across. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye, ma'am. Bye, 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 bye,